heart, no, no grace, no change, no problem. But if you give evidence, if you show by the new person that you have become in Christ, if that becomes evident, you continue in the faith firmly, established, and steadfast. Not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which is proclaimed under all creation, under heaven, of which Paul, I've been made a minister, he says. Now verse 24, just quickly for you to see this. This is how much he believes in this message. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. As an apostle, because I believe that this is true, because I know that God is doing all this by His grace, and I know regardless of what I face in this lifetime, the completed work of Christ is going to carry me through from the time that I was born again? No. God foreknew before the foundation of the earth that I was going to respond. And so because of His foreknowledge, God has been at work in my life all of this time, bringing me along in this process of grace. And so, now I rejoice, in, even in my sufferings, he said, for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body. Oh, so it is grace, and I am saved by faith in his work and his work alone. But now that I've done that, there is this thing where I do my share. Now remember we talked, we talked about three groups of people that we preach to. One are the lost. Well, the other group of people are saved people. Some of the saved people are people who are, in fact, born again, but because of whatever's going on in their life at the time, they're not living on it. And so in that situation, you have many scriptures like this one that says that that individual is out of fellowship. Oh, they lose their salvation? No. But they're not in fellowship with God. What does that mean? Well, they need to confess this sin and be cleansed of it. And so until they do, that wonderful sense of fellowship with God is not there. Now, relationship is always there. It's there by God's Nothing can change. But that sense of fellowship, often that individual is missing. How do we know that that's true? Well, the scripture tells us that God disciplines his children. Those whom he loves, he disciplines. Why does he have to discipline them? If by God's grace, they're just being graced through it. And this is a hyper grace view. They're just going to be graced through it. Then why should there be any discipline or correction? But the reality of Scripture is, is that whom God, whom God loves, He disciplines and He corrects every son whom He approves. And so the idea is that God is always at work bringing us along in Christian growth. Now, He's going to make us like Jesus on that day when Jesus is revealed in His glory. And, and I may have a huge amount of change that's going to happen on that day. But I am called to join God in the work in my, that he's doing in my life. It's a gracious work. But I join him in doing the work. The scripture calls it working out my salvation. God put the salvation in me. He has made me a new person in Christ. Nothing can change that if I'm truly born again. And now what is in me needs to get from in me out. So God is calling me to work out my salvation for it to be visible. And this is a balance. Uh, that we have to deal with. The problem is what has happened. One generation emphasizes, you know, that, that God's grace and everything is great. And, and don't, don't get it all in your head that you have to strive and work and do. And because you're going to miss the point of grace. Another group of people says, okay, we've got a very undisciplined group of people who are not serving God in any way. But they're calling grace, grace, grace. And so they're grace abusers. And, and so... You have people who go too close to works to make it seem like they're going to be saved by them. And too, pe too many people who go toward a gracious thing that is beyond what was intended. I don't have to do anything or be anything at all. So where's the balance? Well, I think the balance is seen in first Colossians. I mean, first Colossians, Colossians 1. I think it's seen that God is doing work that can't be explained any other way than God. 
but that we're a part of the process as well. Um, notice in the rest of this in verse 25. Of this church, I was made a minister. Did he make himself a minister? No. Don't get it in your head. You know, being a minister looks kind of easy. All they do is sit around all week and maybe play golf every once in a while. I think I want to do that. Spend most of their time in air conditioning. And, yeah, that sounds good. Come and talk to us about that first. <laughs> but you don't make yourself a minister in the sense that he's talking about God calls people to minister. On the other hand, what? All Christians are ministers. We all minister the ministry of reconciliation, for example. God has reconciled the world to himself through Christ, but then he calls you to join in the work of going out and spreading the message of reconciliation with God. And so it's a grace work, but it is called for works for us to do and to be a part of it. There's a balance here. Verse 26, as you talk about this preaching of the Word of God, the Word of God that is the mystery which has been hidden from ages, past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to the saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of His glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? Which is in Christ. Which is Christ in you, I'm sorry. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now some people would say, and, and I've seen, uh, even in, in, the, in David Platt's book, he talks about a lot of terminology that's not really completely theologically sound. And yet most of the people that use the terminology are thinking about one aspect of it that is real for them. So, I ask Christ into my heart. Okay? Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now, some people would say that what that says is, is I finally came to the end of myself as God was drawing me and making me aware of the fact that I was a sinner. And I agreed with God as he brought that to my awareness that I was a sinner and that I could not save myself. And so I responded to the call of Christ and I asked him to come into my heart. Muscle? No. The inner man. I responded to receive. And to receive? Well, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Okay. Are there better ways sometimes to say what the salvation experience, how to define it in short terms? Yes. There are really good ways. <laughs> but none of the ways that you have commonly heard are without some merit. Even as you read uh, David's book, you'll see that he gets that what they're saying is this part of it. But he's afraid that that understanding is causing him to make wrong choices about what salvation is or how to live. So, um, quickly, jump to the slide, the oldest New Testament And by the way, Colossians 1 just goes on and finishes. It's all about it. The oldest New Testament book, according to most scholars, is 1 Thessalonians. And that book precedes the written gospel. Now, the gospel was being presented in a verbal tradition. Yeah, the scholars call it quill, Q. And not from Star Trek. And so... See, there it go, middle pictures. You got it. And so here we go with this information. The book starts with the idea of grace and it ends with the idea of grace. And yet, when Paul talks about these things, he says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. So, yes, salvation and the ability to serve God all come by His grace, by His power. I have no ability to serve aside from Christ. Without me, you can do nothing. So it's all about grace. 
But in the Christian life, we're not being called to spin the plates or obey the rules. We're being called to keep in mind that we have a work of faith and a labor of love and steadfastness that are a part of that process. First Timothy also uh, from Paul instruct them to do good. <coughs> so remember that there are three people that we're talking to. Some that are lost. Some that are saved. They're not walking with the Lord. Some that are mature or maturing. That's the other group. And there are really subgroups even in that. But we do have a sense of calling each other, stimulating each other to love and good deeds, Hebrews, to do good. Not to gain salvation, to be more saved or to be more approved by God. But because of our love for God and our love for each other. To be generous and ready to share. Here's some evidence of things we can do. These people are storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life and deep. In other words, they'll get over the idea of I do everything that I live to do for me. I'm following Jesus for me. I'm doing what I do at the church for me. If that is where you are in the reality of your relationship with God, there's a pretty good chance that you're not saved. Because this is the idea. The idea is that I come to God because I am a sinner, unworthy. And He comes in and changes me. And the things that I do then are based on the reality of who He is. It is that I die to an old way of life. And the life that you now see is Christ in me. So let's talk about some grace realities real quick. Um, one can only be fully understand and living in grace, teaching others to do the same. You can do that without using the word grace. You don't have to say that word. Jesus preached grace without saying the word. Not once, not in one sermon that Jesus ever preached did he ever use the word grace. And he talked about grace all the time. Everything that God was doing was by grace. Jesus is not the only one that did that. In fact, like I mentioned, uh, the Apostle John, 1 John, 3 John, the word grace never appears. But it's hard to keep it out of Scripture because by the time the Gospels have been developed and you have the interpretive Gospel of John that is explaining how all these things God has done, He's done by His grace because He loves us. You know, Peter and everybody else, they're starting to write constantly using a theological term that is the reality of Scripture <coughs> that people would understand God does this because He is gracious. Songwriters, I did a little research, have written songs of grace without using the actual word. I was looking at an old Baptist hymnal. And uh, there are 39 hymns listed under the category of grace. Do you think that's all the song book talks about grace? No way. It's full of things about grace. Because every good thing that's going on in my life and yours as a child of God is a grace work of God. I don't deserve it. I can do nothing to keep it or to have it. It's just that God does it. And so we can sing, brethren, we are met to worship, or holy, 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 or come now, almighty king. Or God be the glory. No word grace. It's not in there. But let's talk about to God be the glory. Oh, perfect redemption. The purchase of blood. To every believer. The promise of God. The vilest offender. Who truly believes. That moment. From Jesus. A pardon. Receives. Did you hear the word grace? No, but did you hear grace? Oh, praise God, you heard grace. And so we have to remember that, that the words can be principles, they can be concepts, and they don't have to be reflective of a particular language or understanding that we have. And so we find ourselves dividing over preference. 
If you're listening for special language of your biblical understandings rather than listening for biblical grace principles, there will be divisiveness, and that works both ways. What do you mean? If I'm an old-timer and I'm not hearing people saying what I believe to be grace in, in my old words, then what's wrong with it? There's something wrong with them, people. And on the other hand, you have people who have come up in a, a situation where the terminology of grace has maybe reached back uh, to some previous century or new understandings because of the concern in their own lifetime about how they see the church so weak and puny and, and trying to make it on their own in their flesh. And, and they are tired of that and they're looking for someone to respond. We cannot allow ourselves to be divided over terms. Because who's behind that? It's spiritual warfare to tear us apart. When we love the same Jesus and we're trying to get through the same process together. So if one doesn't use the word grace, it doesn't mean that you're telling people to live by the law. Of course not. Grace principles are all in these messages. There are room in messages to group two and group three that are listening about doing good, doing better. But only for people who are saved. If you've not received Jesus by the grace of God, by His calling, and received Him as Lord and Savior, forget doing good deeds and quit trying to impress people. God's not caring about what you're doing. It's doing you no good at all. In fact, let me tell you what it's doing. David Platt will tell you the same thing. It's giving you a false sense of the fact that you're okay. When in fact, if you stop breathing, you must tell wide open. Is that faith that you have a genuine saving faith in God that you have been able to have by His